Welcome to Mass Musings, a podcast where art and history come together. Brought to you by the Maslin Museum. On today's podcast, we will be speaking with Studio M artist Alana Cartwright about her current exhibition, Clothed in Resilience, currently on view from March 6th through March 28th, 2021. The exhibition is a visual diary expressing people's journeys to reclamation after experiencing sexual violence. Images are juxtaposed with articulations that capture the essence of healing and recovery. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so pleased to introduce our Studio M artist, who is our podcast guest today, and Anna Young, who runs social media here at Maslin Museum. My name is Emily Vigil, and I am the Studio M coordinator. Uh, Studio M is our designated gallery for contemporary art and all media. And um, this is the very first time that we're getting to interview an artist. And it's also another first, which is she is the first time that we have had a student exhibition in Studio M. We started this initiative actually a couple of years ago. Um, and so we've been waiting for the show for a long time because it did get postponed. And so I'm so eager and so pleased that it's up on the walls now. But I wanted to mention that she was a student exhibition because we have the opportunity for other students in Northeast Ohio colleges and universities who are pursuing their studio art degree to apply to have an exhibition. And so uh, they would apply in the fall for a show the following semester. So um, I would like to introduce to you Anna Young, who is, as I say, our handles our social media here at Maslin Museum. Both Anna and myself are also artists as well. So hi, Anna. Hello. Very happy and, to be here. And Alana Cartwright is, <laughs> is a photography, oh. a studio art major from Cleveland State University with a concentration in photography. And you are graduating this year, right? This spring. I am. So that's very exciting. And very I'm so um, happy to get to hear more about your career as an artist and how you came to come up with this body of work that's at Maslin Museum. Thank Would you. you like to tell us a little bit about how you got started? Like when you were young, did you know you were going to be an artist? When did you start to have an interest in photography? Well, actually, it's a crazy story. I started getting into photography after the death of my uncle because, you know, when somebody passes away, you want to cling on to those memories so much. And I realized that a lot of the times when we were creating those memories, we didn't really document them and we had very few photos. So it just really inspired me and motivated me to capture more because life can be fleeting and I wanted to capture the beauty of those moments that I wanted to cherish so that later if I looked at them like I could feel those emotions again and so I started taking photos after he passed away and I believe I was 14 and I just started like documenting everything but I started to see the beauty of everything around me and it just, the love of photography really just grew from there and capturing human beings and real experiences. But um, my mother's an artist and I, I think my family is rather creative. So I think the, the foundation was always there, but that's how I really got started. Cool. When did you get your first camera? Was that when you were first 14 then too? Or? Well, I was shooting on my mother's DSLR when I was younger. And then I think I got my first camera when I was like 18 or 19. And it's the camera that I still use now. I wow. had switched from a Nikon to a ca uh, Canon and it's my baby. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever shoot with your cell phone? Like if you don't have your camera with you, and do you consider that like part of your work or do you consider that more like research for your work? 
Uh, both actually. A lot of times I have an idea and I snap some things on my phone just as kind of like reference images for continuing to grow the idea. Or sometimes if something turns out, then yes, it's still my work. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, when you shoot, um, when you take a photograph with your phone, do you ever get to a point where you're like, oh man, like this is such a good photograph. I wish that it was actually taken on my oh, yeah. camera where I can actually like make a print out of it. I, I feel like that's one of the biggest struggles, but with the like newer phones, it's just crazy. Like sometimes you can actually get like a really nice print out of it. You really can. You really can. Like you might run into some complications if you wanted to print it pretty large, but overall, like the quality is just really improving. So I like that because a lot of times, like when I went, I studied abroad in Spain for a month and a lot of times I wanted to take a photo of something at my camera, just the, I couldn't get farther enough away from it. So it's like, all right, thank God I have a solid, actually, this isn't even, this isn't even an accurate story because I, my phone got stolen after the first week. So I really only could do that for the first week. And then I had a burner and it was just experience everything in front of you. <laughs> oh no. That's oh my the gosh. Worst. It was <laughs> tragic, but whatever. Lost all my photos. They weren't backed up. <laughs> oh no. Story of everyone's <laughs> life. I feel like Wow. Like, like every single year, somehow I lose all my. Well, I have a background in painting, and sometimes I wish as if, like, that my artwork was digital, so that, you know, which is like the opposite problem to have because I feel like, okay, I have too much, too many objects, too much stuff in my studio. If I worked on a digital platform, I could organize my stuff so much better, but then I didn't think about like, what if you lose it? That's huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And of course you have to always like think about technology evolving and updating files and something that was good quality before is maybe not good quality 10 years down the line. So, yeah. well, I would love for us to get introduced to the project that's actually in studio M, which is Alana's body of work called clothed in resilience. And um, there is an opportunity for people to actually reserve uh, to come and meet the artists during our extended gallery hours, which is on March 27th from 5 to 7 p.m. And we have an event right link up on our website. So if you are in the region and you can come and um, meet Alana in person, that would be wonderful. But of course, the exhibition is open. You don't have to have an appointment to just come and visit the museum um, anytime during our regular business hours, 9.30 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday, and 2 to 5 on Sundays. So with that, Alana, could you introduce us to the Clothed and Resilience proje Project and tell us all about it? Yes. Um, well, in essence, Clothed and Resilience was a project that I did really just to inspire healing. I, well... Do you want to hear about the concept, how it came to be, or just... Yeah, we right. can start yes. there. And then I okay. also have images that I can pull up so that everybody who's looking at this as a video can see it and we'll describe them for our podcast audience. Yeah, okay. So actually, the, the concept of the series is about survivors of sexual assault and honoring them and essentially just showing that they are warriors in this excruciating battle and that healing is a very attainable and like worthwhile experience because a lot of times you tend to feel like when you're going through something with that kind of a magnitude that it's just a pain that you have to bear and live with forever and I had gotten to a point in my life where I thought that honestly like something should be said about that, that it like people, there, there should be some kind of hope that you can instill in people to tell them somebody who has at least experienced a fragment of that healing to say, like, I hear you and I see you and to keep on fighting. Um, the concept in its most basic and undeveloped form, I actually had years prior to actually making the book itself. Um, originally I had wanted to, just actually do a really similar set of photos. And I took photos of my best friend in the 
just the cheapest studio lights you could get on Amazon, like in a little laundry room studio that I had set up. And I paired it with a poem that uh, was about the human touch on the body. But if you read the poem, you would honestly have no idea that it was about sexual assault or the healing. And at the time, that's what I was comfortable with. And it was just kind of a personal project that I wanted to do for myself. But fast forward some years, I had experienced some profound and miraculous healing myself. And it was what restored me and saved me. And I thought, why not grow this concept? Because it was always lingering in the back of my mind that I, I wanted to do the idea justice because I wasn't exactly like happy with how it had turned out. It wasn't necessarily entirely true to the conviction in my heart. And I had gotten to a point where I wanted to just be transparent and give other people a place to express themselves and to just have a voice and just something that could represent hope and to tell people like, this doesn't have to just be a part of you forever. That always is pain. Like you can conquer it. So well, there it began. <laughs> it was actually, yeah. And it was actually, um, a, a project that was assigned for in school. Like, well, not this itself. We had to make a photo book and it just kind of dawned on me. I said, okay, this is the perfect opportunity to do this. But if not now, then when? So, wow, it is a powerful show and a brave and courageous show for all of the participants involved. And that does speak to, you know, the heart of what an artistic practice can do as far as creating an opportunity for healing from trauma, you know, as well as um, awareness for, mm -hmm. for everybody and communication. So, not only that, but the work itself is just very beautiful and striking. Um, when you walk into the gallery, you're kind of enveloped with these images and the rich black, white, gray tone. So I, with that, would love to share some of the images and have you talk about individual yeah. ones themselves. So Alana, could you de describe this first photograph titled Mercy? Yes. Um, Mercy is a photograph that I took of the model. They're facing away from me and it's a portrait where their face is slightly turned to the right. So you can see a bit of their um, profile illuminated from the light. But the main focus of the photograph is their back and the way that their hands and arms are positioned behind them. Their arms are crossing in a pose that what honestly, what I found really beautiful about this image was just the fact that the way the arms are crossed behind them isn't necessarily a comfortable or an easy pose for some people, depending on how flexible you are. But the way that the model maintains the pose is just elegant and almost like just delicate or relaxed in a way. And yeah, that's what really just resonated with me in it. And this is actually the first image that a person entering the gallery would see. Um, when you walk into Studio M, you have to kind of turn a corner to come in. And at the top of the gallery, you can look at Alana's book, closed photo book, closed in resilience and read about it. And then you can come in and see the images. And this is the very first one. This is called Validity. One thing I love about the image is it, it shows you're kind of looking at hair tossed to the side and you're looking over her shoulder and her face is kind of turned to the side. So the detail that you see is all in the texture of the hair and the corner of her ear and the earring. And um, it just is, it's a very, I think, um, open, you know, because it's, it's a, a view you might see of someone when you're standing very close to them. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's, I just admire the, the bravery and courage of the people who participated in this project to allow you to work with them. And I'm curious what it was like to actually do the photo shoot? Like, could you walk us through that experience? Yeah. Um, 
It was actually an amazing experience. And I am just floored with the trust that people put into me also, because most of the people that did this project were complete strangers. Like most of them, I, I had put something out on social media saying, this is a project that I'm doing. And if you want to be a part of it, like, let me know. You can hear more about it. It was just a very general overview of it. But I had just some main points of like, you know, anybody who is doing it, like if they are like, once we have that conversation and they've decided, yes, I want to shoot with you and all that, there were just some things that were kind of like needed to be decided at the beginning. Like if they were going to be anonymous or not, and that was entirely up to them. And if they were comfortable being photographed, that being anonymous was of course going to be respected. Their photos would be unidentifiable. And also it was like, depending on how much of your skin that you wanted to show, that was also entirely up to the model, but the actual shoots themselves honestly went really smoothly. I got a lot of really positive feedback. People said that I made them feel really comfortable, which I genuinely meant the world to me because I did feel very like I was very adamant about like making sure people felt respected and I just wanted to give them a safe place where they could express themselves and have this be an experience that they would be thankful for and cherish so um yeah a shoot uh everybody is different really I had like once I'm in the shoot I get to work with the person's temperament and their uh, we create our own dynamic and that kind of fuels how we work. There were a lot of similarities to each shoot though. I mean, for one thing, everybody got to watch me fumble around and stumble with studio lights. And I think that kind of like broke some tension at the beginning, me just (laughs) making a fool of myself in a way. And, you know, I just get to talking to somebody and making sure like a lot of times before shoots, I sketch out poses so that I have a framework. Pardon? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I sketch out poses so that I have a framework for what I want, what I'm envisioning for the person who's coming in. And then depending on how we work, some people are really good at posing themselves. So they might kind of take the initiative to start posing and I might just have to alter small things. Other people are not used to being in front of the camera at all. So we find a rhythm, we work, we find a groove and it's really just a matter of, I think what's really important as a photographer is being able to like watch the way people move, watch their, like just notice all of these small and candid beauties and just their essence and their being and capture that because a lot of the photos were really like, stop right there. Like, this is good. Like just do do what you're doing right there, you know? Um, But yeah, each one, it, it was just a really remarkable experience. Like I had some like really emotional moments with so many of the people that came in and they started as strangers, but ended up being people that are just like left an imprint on me and are really good friends today, actually. So. Wow. Let's see another one. This one is titled hope. Mm -hmm. So Alana, tell me how you came to this composition. It's one of the few compositions where you can see the person's face. Mm -hmm. So you can describe it and um, talk about it a little bit. Yeah. So this is actually one of those candid portraits that I was just talking about. Um, It just turned out to be so stunning. She was like flipping her hair to the side. Her head is tilted down a bit and there's her curls are falling onto her face and her eyes are either pointed down or closed, but just her face is just it's just beautiful. I mean, everybody is beautiful, but just the expression on it and the way that it fit the frame, everything was just so captivating. And she's wearing a necklace that she actually asked me if she could make and wear for the shoot. And I was all for it. It says in the beads, do not touch me or no, don't touch me without my explicit consent, which I think was cool because it got to incorporate some of her personality and what like, it was a shoot that, you know, it's for a project that I had thought of, but it's her own personal like handprint in it, you know? Yeah. That's so wonderful. So in a way, the people who participate in the project, they are like deeply a part of it in terms of being collaborators with you for this, which is really unique. I know Anna 
as a photographer yourself, what have your experiences, like how do you relate to this as a photographer working with a human figure and working with others when you do a photo shoot? I mean, it's, it's tricky and um, there is, you can tell, you can tell more about the relationship between the photographer and the person, um, you know, depending on how, how the end product comes out. I mean, you can see through uh, all of Alana's photographs that she has these really intense connections. She's been able to make, um, make everybody feel really, really comfortable. And especially with a, with a very, you know, serious subject like this, I think that it's, it's wonderful and um, not everybody can do that. So, I mean, it's just amazing the emotion and story that's being captured. And um, I had a question um, about the choice to use black and white over color images for this project, actually, um, because the 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 way that you have grabbed all of these different tonalities and the contrast is just beautiful, and it adds into that story that you're expressing um, for almost for um, these people. Um, and I think that it would definitely be a very different project um, with with color uh, photography. So I want to hear a little bit more about that choice. Yeah, um, that was a really big decision. Or It wasn't, honestly, from the beginning, I knew that I wanted to do these portraits in black and white, but I still did contemplate it, like, why am I doing this? Um, and it kind of came down to three reasons. One was that something about black and white portraiture just draws me in and has this raw emotional experience that is very unique from anything else. So I definitely thought for a concept like this, I wanted to have that raw emotional effect that I think really like black and white photography just does something beautiful in its own way. And um, I also wanted, like you said, to have a lot of leeway and flexibility with editing and playing with the contrast and the values, just not having to worry about like how accurate skin looked because I wanted this to be very high contrast and just accentuate these highlights and shadows and everything in the images. And also because not everybody wanted to have their identity in this project. So black and white photography also was the best option to make people like photographs look the least identifiable for those who didn't want to be, you know, shown. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you explain that you were going to do this in black and white um, to, um, your participants before you made the made the images with them yeah um that was kind of one that went without saying I think also or not went without saying it was just like I kind of told them this is what I'm envisioning for the shoot and no matter what like area of healing you're in because so much about this was being able to gauge where people are in the healing process and adapt to that and meet them where they are. So when I was going into explaining this, I made sure like, these are all the details that I can give you. And another big important thing in the shoot is that like, obviously I, I didn't, sh- or well you can, but I didn't shoot them in black and white. I shot them in color and kind of described like, so when I put this in black and white, here's how this is going to, you know? Um, but I also had people look at the images before they left the shoot, because like a lot of times you're meeting me for the first time and you might be nude in front of me posing so I was like you're gonna know exactly what I have and what I'm working with and no matter what goes into the book you will have final say on that as well so let's take a look at a few of the images from the clothed and resilience artist book photo book um so you can get a sense of what it's like as you're looking through and this one actually has writing, explaining some of the experiences that the people have had. So Alana, I'm, I'm assuming that the writing is written by the person who's pictured. Is that right? Yes. All the statements are in the 
personal, their personal handwriting. And they usually just sent me a, either a picture or PDF of it. And I'd scan it or, or they would give me like a physical copy and I would scan it and just remove the background and edit the words. Sometimes the individual letters to like move them into the correct. Wow. It was I very thought, tedious, but it was worth it. Like this I, one that I is, wondered if they, if the, the person wrote, like you did a great job. Cause to me, looking at it, it looks like, especially with this particular spread, like it's written specifically to the shape. So mm-hmm. you did that in Photoshop based yeah. off of the writing that they sent you or they gave you. Yes. Wow. Wow. Well, I guess that's a challenge with, um, with Photoshop and, you know, and thinking about a photo book, like just the design of it, how do the words interact with the images? Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of them are really like every single page that I had words and some images, it was like, okay, now how am I gonna pair these two together in a way that is visually like intriguing, but also like the words aren't getting lost in the composition either. And so it, it was definitely really challenging, but I honestly had such a fun time with it once it was all said and done. Like, I think it was like my favorite part about how this book really came to be so unique in itself is because the juxtaposition of the statements with the photographs are different for each one. And a lot of them, I usually used like the contours of the body to frame, or some of them, I even had this one um, woman had actual diary pages that she had written and she just gave them to me. Like I, I literally still have them, but I scanned them and put them in the book, but I literally still have like actual pages that she wrote, which is crazy. I'm like, you're giving me some? Wow. But it's just amazing, honestly. As a viewer who's experiencing this exhibition, the fact of using something as personal as a book that you flip the pages on, I mean, I think that it is a respectful way of learning about their experiences because that's something that, you know, as I say, it's personal, like one person is reading it. Mm -hmm. And the photographs that you walk into the gallery and see, I feel like they are triumphant. Like, that's what I feel like, you know, with the titles that you've given the photographs um, that speak to the healing, like, how did you determine what word you, or did you have the title in mind while, while you were doing the photo shoot as to like what quality that photo would possess? Well, I, most of the titles actually, actually, no, I think all of them I made after the photographs already existed. And it was really just, I looked at the photograph and I knew that I wanted to title them with edifying characteristics that represented just reclaiming dignity and value after they have been damaged by something like this. And so each one was kind of like, I look at an image and what am I feeling when I'm getting from it? And this one that's on the PowerPoint is titled introspection. And I came to that conclusion because something about the, well, to describe it, this is a photo of um, a woman's legs. It's a it's one of the 10 by 20. So it's a long skinny photograph and it's a photo of her legs crossing and she's bending over and one of her arms is reaching to like kind of hold on to the opposite leg and the opposite, the other arm actually wraps kind of inside and around the arm that's reaching and introspection seems like a lot of that, the reaching and the looking inward and just that heart searching kind of experience and looking at this photograph, that's what it spoke to me. And that's pretty much the process of how I went to come find all the words for these. And like, I think, I think that I learned some really cool words too, because a lot of times, like I I wanted to come up with a word, but it just seemed too basic. So I was in my thesaurus a lot too, because I said, all right, this is what I want to say about it. But how do I find a word that really like captures that, like the magnitude of the image? Yeah. 
I can see that. So tell us about this image. This is called Breath. Yes, this is uh, one of my favorites. Actually, it, um, it's a photo of the male torso and his chin is tilted up while his neck cranes to, if you're looking at the photograph, it's craning to the left and his arms are crossed in front of him. And this one just, it's titled breath because like you see veins and muscles and bones kind of bulging and protruding and just the texture of the skin is so very raw and you see his rib cage bulging as it would when someone takes a deep breath, like your lungs are filling with air and there you have the title. <laughs> yeah. You're really good at giving us, it's almost like a, it's such a small sliver of their face. Like even in the previous one that was talked about where it almost looks like the 10 by 20 long skinny where the legs mm -hmm. are crossed and then the arms are kind of intertwined. Um, when I first saw that image, I kind of had to do a double take because at first it was like, are there two people in there? No, it's just one person. And then um, like this one um, with the male torso and it's kind of the chin coming up, um, you just get a, such a small glimpse of their face. And then the last mm -hmm. one, you could see like the nose and the chin kind of like peeking out of the top of the frame there. And um, I love that. I think it's really smart and it kind of, you know, makes it so you're like yes like you know these are they're 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 fragments of a person but it's still that person like coming through but but it gives that I personally I think it's like the strength of that person being like I could give you it all but I'm not going to give you all of this because you don't deserve it kind of thing where it's just like I'm only yeah. kind of giving you this like the strength of what you know like I want you to have mm -hmm. and and I really like I really like how how compositionally like you do that in a lot of the photographs so whether Thank you yeah yeah <laughs> that's, a, that's a really interesting take on it actually um there's a lot more portraits in the book itself the actual room of framed images is mostly portraits that like you said maybe have a little bit of the face but they're mostly like just really emphasis on the body. And part of that is also because I feel like experience something like sexual assault where it's a crime against your body and your soul and your mind. But a lot of times, like the physical imprint and effect of that affects you psychologically and it affects the way that you actually view your body and the way you even feel in your own skin. So a lot of this, like these photos of the body were specifically because a lot of reclaiming that value and dignity is so much of just that idea of the body being your home. And when it's damaged, like you, you have to like take care of that home because you're in it. And that process of healing, honestly, in my own experience, taking photos of my body was very influential in changing the way that I saw myself and viewed myself as a work of art when I didn't feel like one. So uh, that was, that was really, I mean, and the, the portraits too, a lot of those are in the book, but yeah, the room is mostly just these photos of the body because I want to look at this form and how exquisite it is, even like against every negative feeling that you may have had along this journey. But Emily brought up a really good point that the feeling when you get into the room is like triumphant. And that is a large reason why like I chose the photos in the room to be what they are. And I think it's a different experience when you walk into the room versus when you're opening the book. And that was very purposeful. And I think that both of those experiences are really important, but I did want them to be distinct. Yes. Yeah, I would agree that they're, they're both, you know, just from the perspective of a viewer and someone else experiencing this artwork, you're the pain is there. You are acknowledging the pain. It's not as if you're, you're not acknowledging that, but the emphasis is on the healing. And that's just so wonderful to be able to use art in that way. And, mm -hmm. and it's very powerful. So, um, 
just talking about the book. So somebody who is interested, even if you don't live in the area, even if you can't see the exhibition in person, which you all should come and see um, if you can, you can order the book from our museum shop as well. Um, and it is something I think like takes longer, a longer time to digest and it's a more personal kind of experience flipping through those pages. So um, do you consider this a completed series? And can you talk about the idea of recovering as like a continue, a continued journey? Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. So the, I do consider this a finished series and it is a resolved body of work. When I first made the book for the class that I decided I'm going to do this project for this school assignment. I made it into like, not necessarily a thesis, but kind of like a thesis. And so I had in mind because I had to meet a deadline for it that I would recreate it at a later date. So I made the book and it was printed through the site that we were using for class. And then afterwards I went to redesign the book and I, I shot with some more people and I went to redesign the book and then I actually started it from scratch. Like I used all the same photographs, but I re-edited everything. I re-edited the statements onto the bodies, which made a world of difference because it was crazy how much my ideas had grown and it just looked a lot more sophisticated the next time around when I went to edit it. And, um, yeah, I did everything all from basically the beginning with the same ideas, but with a refreshed mind. And I think that's part of the reason why it feels so resolved is because I did have this second shot of like remaking this to be what I wanted it to be. And in terms of healing being a continuing process, I a hundred percent believe that it is. I mean, at so many different points, I honestly felt like untouchable, which is kind of naive in retrospect, um, to think about it, but there were so many points where I was like, okay, yeah, I'm good. And then something happens and it feels like a setback, but it's just healing isn't linear. It is a continuing process. And just like, we're continuing to evolve and grow every single day. You're also continuing to recover and heal. And sometimes you don't even know when you're healing at some point you might get to a, like you might get to a point where, you've with new perspectives and new things that you've learned and new growth, all of a sudden you realize that this whole time you've been recovering and you didn't even necessarily know. And there are also many facets to healing that like, there are many different parts of you that are affected when you experience trauma. And so a lot of times like life has a way of putting events into your life to I don't know, they're orchestrated some kind of way that if you can really take a hold of the experience and then prepare your mind to like really battle it, like you'll, you'll come out on top. Wow. So what are you working on now? What is, do you want to tell us about your new series? Sure. sure. Um, so my new series I actually did for, let's see, it was last semester for um, my like the senior level topics in interdisciplinary art class. And I, it, it's basically, it's a very similar in some aspects of just showing the exquisiteness of the human body. But I was out of the studio this time. I was taking photos of um, the human body and the human person in a natural environment. And the concept was to show the evolution of harmony to chaos in a relationship that is heavily affected and impacted by the environment. And so you kind of see this input output relationship where um, as the environment develops and evolves the relationship and the dynamic between the two people, my models also changes. And I shot it with five stages in mind. They were harmony, codependency, uh, let's see, disorder, estrangement, and then finally reconciliation. And I had them initially posed in this like garden type of scene that was like inspired by the garden of Eden and just this idea where humans are together and it's harmonious. And eventually um, the 
the scene changes from this like calm, serene garden type of feel to being darker and desolate. And you just, you just see this progression in there. And I, I was really happy with that body of work, but that is one that while that series I considered to be finalized and resolved, um, I do want to delve into different dimensions of the work and kind of play with that concept more. So where can somebody see, as, do you have any exhibitions coming up where maybe somebody could see something from that body of work or your website? Where would Yeah, somebody- um, I have the photos on my website and they're also on like my social media, my Instagram, but I will be exhibiting that body of work in the uh, CSU Merit Scholar Exhibition that will be in May. Wonderful. I'm not sure the specific day, but it's at the galleries at CSU and it's in early May. Well, I just realized that I I think I just said CSU at the be- beginning, but we mean Cleveland State University. <laughs> so just wanted to say that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the to- while we're on the topic of social media, um, first, if you could throw out um, your handle so that people oh, yes. who are listening can go and follow you because you should. Everybody that's listening or viewing this should definitely follow her. Uh, follow yeah. a lot on social media. <laughs> um, yeah, my Instagram handle is really like the only social media. I have a Facebook that I don't really use very much, but Instagram is Alana M. Cartwright. It's A L A N A M Cartwright, C A R T W R I G H T. Perfect. And my website is just alanacartwright.com. No M, just. Wonderful. Yes. Well, how do you feel about the today's heavy use of social media to grow an artist brand? Do you think that it's, you know, absolutely necessary? I know I've had, you know, different people tell me different things like, oh, I, you know, I, I know some very successful artists that, that very rarely use social media and it's fine. And I talk to other people that say that the only way that they're able to get shows or know about exhibitions or whatever um, is posting on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Yeah, um, I think that it kind of goes both ways. Too much of a good thing can be problematic. And I think that in itself, social media can be a really useful tool in networking, being connected to a lot of different people, putting, getting your foot in certain doors, actually. Like, I think that like getting your work out there, it's a really useful tool for it. But I think with algorithms and everything combined, like sometimes that can be difficult too, because like, Sometimes things get buried. And um, so, yeah, I think that it can be helpful. But at the same time, I think that people are also kind of geared to thinking that like their value or validity as an artist sometimes can be determined on a following. And there are other aspects of it, too. Like it almost dilutes sometimes I think the experience well it doesn't dilute the experience itself of seeing art in person but it almost makes people think like everything is kind of just like in front of me and through my little screen so what do I need to go see something for and the experience that you get face to face with art is just unmatched it's really something unlike anything else you miss so many details in a little screen even like digital images seeing my photos framed on the wall in studio m is so much different than scrolling so um yeah I think that that's one thing that's a little disappointing about social media is that like things start to just be so automatic and accessible that it takes away from those beauties of the actual experience you have seeing art in person and how that affects you yeah I I'm on the same page as you um, with that. I think that um, there's a lot of creation of content specifically for Instagram. Um, The quality of images specifically is definitely cut down. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just, it's just so quick and dirty that people aren't really like spending, like you said, spending time with it. So um, basically what we're saying is that you should go see art in person, no matter where it's at. It's one of the safest things that you could do. During this time, just a little plug there. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I also had another question about um, what if you have any plans and no pressure. I want to put any pressure on you. But if you have any plans, um, you know, after graduation, are you thinking about, you know, freelancing or going to grad school or if there's anything or just kind of, you know, taking it day by day and and 
do well, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, no, I actually am going to go study at the Cleveland Institute of Art for a year. I applied for this post-baccalaureate scholarship that Cleveland State University offers, and I recently found out that I got it. So I'm going to go study there for a year. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to learn. They have so many resources, and oh, I'm so excited to go to school for another year because, like, why not take advantage of the opportunity? Um, but at the same time, like, I think it would be cool. I think you can like get your bachelor's plus 18 and you can teach at colleges and like teaching isn't necessarily what I like am planning on doing, but I think that it might just be a nice thing to have under my belt if one day I do want to do that. But, um, my minor is also Spanish. So there's a large part of me that I want to move to a Spanish speaking country for a time, maybe be like a TESOL, like teaching English as a second language and like doing art while I'm over there, but just honing those skills because eventually I want to be traveling and being able to really form connections and with the people that I get to capture and document. And I'd like to do that in somebody's native language. That's wonderful. Well, congratulations. I am so excited to see, you know, everything that you, that you do with that. And it's just going to be amazing. Yay. I just want to thank everybody who's been involved. Like literally everybody who played a role in this entire process, you two, Alex, Brandon, like I'm probably forgetting names, but just working with you guys, especially, I mean, some of you guys have just met, but Emily, like I've been talking to you for a long time now because this has been a postponed uh, experience. Uh, like just everybody who's been involved. Oh, and that is another one. Like I, I just loved getting to meet and get to know everybody. And you guys have just been like the most positive and wonderful atmosphere for like, this is my first solo exhibition. So you've made this whole experience just so valuable to me and like, Love it. Love you guys. <laughs> we are so pleased that we can say, oh, Alana had her first solo <laughs> because I'm excited, really excited for you. And, you know, now that you're graduating and you have these plans to go to CIA and who knows, you're on the doorstep of something here. Mm -hmm. And we are um, pleased and honored to be a part of your the beginning of your artistic career. So thank you so much for, for sharing this important body of work with us and with our audience and our museum visitors. And, you know, what you were saying before about social media and diluting the experience, if you have the chance, if you're able to come to the museum and experience this in person, it's a wonderful opportunity to do so. And this is a short show. Um, so, you know, if you can make it in our doors, you have until March 28th to come and see Clothed in Resilience yourself. And thank you so much, Alana, for joining us for our very first podcast. Thank you. This is so fun. <laughs> The Maslin Museum would like to extend a huge thank you to our operating grantors, Arts and Stark, and the Ohio Arts Council for making programs like this possible. We'd also like to thank Matt O'Ness for giving us a podcast idea in the first place. <laughs>